Good evening. For those of you that I don't know, I'm Richard Sommer, the Dean of the Daniels Faculty here at the University of Toronto. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all here to the, tonight's Bold Top Lecture featuring Roger Duffy. Before tonight's, uh, I introduce tonight's speaker, I'd like to start by taking a moment to thank our sponsor for this lecture and the entire series, uh, Bold Top series of lectures this year. And uh, this is actually our 10th anniversary um, of support from Bold Top. Their sponsorship has made it possible to welcome a wide range of exceptional speakers from around the world, professionals and academics who are leaders in the fields of architecture, landscape architecture, and urban design, to present public lectures to students, alumni, and the broader Toronto community. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Stefan Sibidlo, who's here in the audience tonight. Um, he's the principal of Bulltop Toronto. I encourage you to go down to the showroom and see not only the beautiful um, Bulltop kitchens and other products, but they often have great art shows. Uh, sometimes even our faculty participate in them. So thank you, Stefan. Also, you can find information on the upcoming Bulltop lectures and all of our public programming, including the dates and locations. And some of them um, are going to be in other sites besides this one. The postcards are available outside on the tables. Um, and you can always find the information on our website. So on to our featured speaker tonight. It's my pleasure this evening to introduce the architect Roger Duffy of the firm Skidmore, Owings and Merle, or as it's known to many of us, SOM. Founded in 1936, SOM has designed and built more than 10,000 projects around the world. Mr. Duffy joined the renowned firm in 1979 after completing his architectural studies at Carnegie Mellon University. SOM is considered by many to be the first and still one of the greatest architecture firms uh, of the modern age. They're really, they were the successor to grand partnerships like Kim Mead and White in the 19th century. As McKim, Mead, and White had done for the Beaux-Arts in America, that is, find a way to build the Beaux-Arts vision at a scale and with cutting edge technologies of, of the time when they were operating, SOM did the same for the international style in the mid 20th century, creating buildings like the Lever House, which rivaled Mies van der Rohe in their, in their clarity of vision and execution. As SOM expanded, its work now spans the globe with an approach that integrates architecture, planning, urban design, engineering, and interiors. Mr. Duffy became a partner at SOM in 1997, and I haven't done the math, but I think he was probably pretty young. Um, and he has distinguished himself among a large team of talented colleagues through his innovative approach, which stresses collaboration, experimentation, and especially finding innovative ways to work with artists and integrate their work and thinking into architecture. <clears throat> now, as some of you frequent our public programming know, we have several streams or kinds of things that we present. With this series, which highlights architects and landscape architects with a strong design ethos, we do not have themes as such. But in reviewing the architects we have presented with my colleagues when I'm reviewing this sort of presentations over the past few years, I noticed we had not featured enough of the work that comes out of large, powerful firms. So last semester, we had Jack Diamond, the head of one of our largest and most successful firms here in Toronto, Diamond Schmidt. And now this semester, we have Roger Duffy at SOM, who, who is really someone that's operating at an even larger scale. And I want to stress that this is important because there is a kind of work today that in its scale and complexity requires the organizational expertise of the larger firms. Yet too often in the schools and in the way architecture is promoted in the culture industry, and this, by this I mean museum uh, exhibitions, publishing and award programs, there is a persistent distinction being made between the seemingly small firms led by the single figure or the small partnership we know that these names, Zaha uh, Hadid or Herzog and Amiran. Um, and there's, so this distinction exists between them and the larger firms like SOM. But in fact, if you look, for example, at the structure of a firm like Herzog and Demiron today, you will find that they are structured in a, very, in a very similar way to SOM with studios and teams. And one might even say they're structured, many of these firms are structured in similar corporate ways. 
So this distinction may not hold as much as we think. So this has been a matter of discussion, actually, most recently among some of my colleagues in the field in the last few weeks. A few weeks ago, you probably would have all seen or read about the announcement that the Pritzker Prize in Architecture was awarded to Alejandro Aravina. Much has been made of Aravina's social housing projects and the way he brought what he terms his elemental architecture to a place in society not often enough served by architects. And I, you know that's something to be lauded. But nevertheless, I think we must be clear that Aravina was awarded the Pritzker Prize because he brought a sophisticated and sometimes surprising architecture to these situations, but he, because he has also built other more conventional but sophisticated institutional works of architecture. I saw his work early on, we were both teaching at Harvard, and he is a very, very sophisticated architect, but very much driven by questions of abstraction and aesthetics. So what I want to say here is that regarding Aravino, we might be, a, and this might be a little controversial, I want to talk about the, where we place value and still identify innovation in our field, about our blind spots, if you will. If you go, for example, and see the residence and dining hall Aravina designed at St. Edwards University in Texas, which unlike his work in Chile, was commissioned with all of the money, but also all of the constraints of building in the United States, you will see a very accomplished work of architecture. But is it, I would say it is in fact no more innovative in its technology or accomplished in its form than many of the institutional projects that have been designed and built by SOM in the last decade. So I think it's important for sometimes for us to see work on its own uh, rather than see it through our preconceptions of who has made it. Today, even projects that appear to be designed by sole authors require ex ex uh, extensive amounts of collaboration across many kinds of creative and technical modes of expertise. And under Mr. Duffy's leadership, SOM has mastered this sort of work. As I have mentioned, Mr. Duffy is well known for partnering with artists on many of his projects, including academic, museum, and gallery spaces, transportation-oriented developments, residential hospitality, and office building projects. Recent projects of note highlight the influence that cities and questions of urban regeneration have had on Mr. Duffy's work. He oversaw the master plan for the creation of Cornell, the Cornell Tech campus on Roosevelt Island in New York City the University Center for the New School, at uh, Parsons New School, at the corner of Fifth Avenue and 14th Street in, in New York City, and the Park Hotel in, uh, in uh, Hyderabad, is that right? Hyderabad, Hyderabad, India, which sits uh, adjacent to a railway. He has also led two teams from SOM in an exploration of alternative visions for the future of Penn Station, um, and Madison Square, Garden, Madison Square Garden in 2013, and the area around Grand Central Terminal in 2012. And I would say, given my mention earlier of McKim and of, of, of White, it is only fitting that SOM would be involved in rethinking the site where one of, the, one of McKim and White's greatest works once stood. More recently, Duffy led teams in the design of two major transportation facilities, Denver Union Station in downtown Denver, and the uh, Tachapartai Shivali International Airport, Terminal 2, outside of Mumbai. One of Mr. Duffy's key initiatives at SOM, now well established, is the creation of the SOM Journal, an annual journal in which an independent jury of artists, designers, and critics select and critique the best work being produced across all of the firms and studio, all, all of SOM's uh, studios and offices. So I would say for the, uh, the students in the audience, if you go to work at SOM, the process of engagement, scrutiny, and critique will not end. It don't, only the stakes will become a little bit higher. So before I bring Mr. Duffy this, to the podium, I want a uh, word on the sort of arrangement tonight. He's going to speak for r roughly about 45 minutes. We're going to do a, a question and answer afterwards. And we'll see how it goes. And maybe we'll take some questions from the audience. So with that, I'd like to welcome Roger Duffy to the stage. Thank you, Dean Summer um, and Stefan. Thank you for the sponsorship, uh, wonderful program that you've sponsored here. Um, when I graduated from school, I grew up in Pittsburgh. I was attracted to the work of SOM. Um, 
uh, in the way that it uh, supported experimentation, or that was my understanding of the firm. So naively, I went um, to work there and discovered uh, a rich history, a rich history of um, first of um, first kind of projects, prototype projects. So Lever House, Dean Summer mentioned the first curtain wall building, Hancock, the first mixed-use exoskeleton tower in the world, Beinecke, the first luminous stone building, Warehouser, one of the first buildings that merged architecture and landscape, and so it goes, the first Teflon roof structure at the Hajj, and uh, on the bottom left, Myron Goldsmith, um, a sort of poetic earlier partner of SOM, uh, developed the first center core clear spanned exoskeleton building as his master's thesis. And all of these things greatly influenced the world and attracted me to this, um, to this platform called SOM. Um, great history of structural innovation. We had a pretty switched on structural engineer named Faz Khan. He died young, but he was the genius behind um, much of the structural innovations that people that are doing these super tall buildings around the world are still using this thinking. So what was I going to do there? I was uh, promoted to be partner at a difficult time in the mid-90s and decided that I would try to work small, uh, not large. Kind of ironic given that the firm is known for large work, but I had to make traction for my practice and develop my own voice within the field. So I accomplished a number of things, but was hum humble and started small, um, and have used it to uh, acquire gigantic commissions somehow. I'm not quite sure how that happened. But an early project here, this is just a sampling of some early and, and later projects. Greenwich Academy on the bottom, sort of toward the left. A really important project, sort of the first school that um, I did that was of note, and it helped springboard um, other opportunities. Uh, Deerfield Academy, collaboration with James Terrell, a great uh, conceptual artist. Um, so all the lighting in that project was art lighting. Uh, imagine such a thing. Uh, the first net zero school in east of the Mississippi, so PS62, it just opened. Uh, so it generates as much energy as it uses over the course of the year. And I'll go through some of the ones. I, I picked out five just to go through today. So Dean Summer mentioned uh, New School. It was a large commission for me uh, in an urban context, a fantastic site. So uh, north of Washington Square Park and just south of Ladies Mile Historic District and adjacent to Union Square in the center of Manhattan. Not many sites like this. Most of the building that's happening in New York City is on the fringes of the city, very few happen in the center. So a great commission and for a great client. So this is one of the facades of the project. The new school was started after the First World War. A lot of refugees came from Europe after the war and they were seeking uh, institutional freedom, pedagogical freedom to teach the way they wanted to teach. They wanted to have a sort of democratic kind of uh, curriculum and pedagogy for the school, so a kind of radical underpinnings. John Cage and people like Lawrence Weiner, people like that either went or taught there, so very important people in the arts and in the social sciences. They had a bespoke building that was done in the uh, early part of the Depression by a theater designer, Joseph Urban, and it's quite a clever building. It had a sort of reverse emphasis the facade actually leans out 10 inches. It has this brick horizontal striping to it. So it actually looks perfectly vertical when you see it. This is on 12th Street in Greenwich Village. Um, and it's because of this uh, reverse emphasis leaning out 10 inches. The school is dispersed, so they're all over Greenwich Village. They have all these orange properties around here, but no campus center. So they had a site, um, they wanted to do a new building, uh, and we were hired to do that new building, and it was meant as a university center. Most campuses are horizontal, uh, laterally disposed, and interconnected in their own way. You can think of all the great campuses around. I think yours is 
similar to this typology, some with quads and some not. And we had to envision a more vertical impression of that kind of solution. Um, so this is a, a series of vertical quads interconnected with three uh, fire stairs on each facade that exhibit the activity of the project and interconnect the vertical quads of this academic campus. So we hadn't found an example of this being done before, Ex externalizing the fire stairs. We discovered many interesting things about this. One is that you can use regular <coughs> glass if you put it on the perimeter, not fire glass. Uh, you can get natural light into stairs so people actually use them. They're not hermetic in the center of the building. And for very little incremental cost, we could put an open stair on top of the enclosed fire stair. So a bit like the subway in New York, there's an express stop and a local stop depending on where you want to go through the building. And the facade here is brass. I'll go into that a bit. It's actually an alloy of brass called Munts Metal. So it's 60% copper and 40% zinc. Uh, we wanted to do that instead of copper because it's uh, more color stable. So it'll look like this into the future. Worked hard on the exact finish and the shingling. Um, so the big feature pieces are the uh, fire stairs on each of the three primary facades that exhibit the activity of the building. But you can see other horizontal uh, windows and each studio in the building, each classroom has two windows, a vision window at eye level height and then a, a light harvesting window above. And these windows have a slight tint to them. So in different aspects of moving around the building, you can't tell if it's a solid building with just this diagonal fissuring or um, you know, if, if it's a building with uh, windows for classrooms. This is, uh, so the first one was Fifth Avenue facade. This is the 13th Street facade. And this is the 14th Street facade. So that kind of activity is on display all around the building. Uh, just to note that the Bottom seven stories plus two levels below grade are the academic stack for the building. And these are tall floor to floor heights. So they have cafeterias and libraries and design studios and science classrooms and offices, all that sort of thing. And on top of it is an 800 bed um, dormitory with a separate entrance and interconnected uh, egress situation. So very complicated. Um, this is some of the work we did to um, imagine this stair, this new kind of circulation system. And we also were pioneering this kind of thinking and had to convince the building department in New York that this would work and have eight uh, horizontal fire shutters to make this work to cordon off different vertical aspects of the building as you have to not only imagine these ideas but be able to pull them off and convince people, build consensus for why these are workable solutions. So um, the elevator consultant, when you do a project like this, you, most projects have different consultants, elevator consultants, and they recommended to the client 20 elevators for the building, in addition to the three required fire stairs that we needed for the population loads at this building. We did our own analysis of this and figured out that if the students used the stairs, instead of being dependent on the elevators. Now think about that, it's really a nine-story academic building, so no small feat. Then we thought we could get away with five elevators in the building and produce about 15% 15 more, 15 more net square feet, usable square feet for the institution to have program for studios <coughs> and classrooms and things. So they were intrigued and they went along with, that, with our analysis. And we built this building with five elevators versus 20 elevators. So the five elevators that we do have uh, stop on each floor of the building. And they open to these uh, open collaborative spaces, which are represented here in yellow. And from those open collaboration space, you see the stairs that are migrating up and down. They're intuitive, they're vis visual, uh, visible um, when you come out of the elevator lobbies or go up and down the stairs. These are large floor plates. They're 30,000 square feet. 
and around it we had a, a clear span 30 foot dimension that's ideal for all the classrooms and studios and the projects and because we located the structure in a particular way we could make all the intermediate walls highly flexible so they can move them around over time is a very big thing in the world now the subject of flexibility and I'll speak more about that now where we located all the infrastructure in these public hallways so that and and the electric distribution and the lighting systems and the mechanical systems and the mechanical controls so it's true flexibility all these intermittent walls can be moved around without changing the basic infrastructure of the building which is a very expensive thing to do uh, you can see the distribution of the mechanicals electrical the lighting this um, project harvests 70 percent during daylight hours of all the lighting needs of the building um, lighting is a big subject there of sustainability probably lots of you do that it's a bit like blocking and tackling now or compulsories and figure skating something you have to do before you get to the free skate um, and lighting is a big part of uh, energy consumption now so in a building like this it's 20 to 25 percent in an airport project it's closer to a third of the tunnel energy consumption so these are important things to master and having spent 10 years hanging out with James Terrell, I learned a lot about um, the subject of light. You can see here the windows. The top one is for light harvesting. has a light um, baffle that bounces the light up onto the ceiling, and the lower one's for, for vision. We had to build mock-ups. The client was worried. It's only 30% glass on the building. You know, is it going to be enough glass? Is it going to feel too closed in? And all those sorts of risks that architects have to do to pull off a project like this. This is one of the um, open migrating stairs. This one happens to be along 14th Street. So the door on the far left is into the um, internal fire stair that has full glass to the outside. And this is the communicating stair built directly on top of it, the same rise to run as the stair below. Um, and it can be open. Uh, to the space and it's unbelievable. So uh, there's lots of social media about that. There are different ways to measure this. You know, is it published? Yes. You know, the students like it? Yes. And all that sort of thing. And we follow some of it on social media, but they barely use the elevators in this building. Kind of remarkable for a building that's nine stories tall. And they love the fact that each side of the building uh, fosters this kind of activity of chance meeting and collaboration and things of that sort. We worked with two artists on this project. I don't have any images. Um, as the fire stairs migrate, there's something called a stair pressurization duct. And typically, because stairs go vertically through a building, the, these stair pressurization ducts are vertical right next to the stair, and you never see them. When a stair like this, the stair pressurization ducts uh, migrate around the floors. And so the artist Rita McBride, who runs the Dusseldorf Academy, where Joseph Boyce uh, once taught, um, clad these migrating stair duct uh, pressurization ducts in pentagonal shaped polished brass. And so they um, appear and disappear in different parts of the building um, and are quite, are quite special. And Greg Ligon did a, a piece, a neon piece, um, quotes by Walt Whitman in the lobby of this project. This is the library on the top of the stack of the building. And the library is the gasket between the dormitory beds above and the academic stack below. And so students can come down and study at night. It has its own security system, or you can ascend up in the academic stack. So it's quite interesting and um, like one of these new uh, imagined newly imagined libraries where it's not so book dependent um, it's more about accessing different forms of knowledge and being able to understand those different forms of knowledge I'll show you another example of that for Barnard College recently there was a beautiful article in the sunday new york times uh, they had a jazz festival in our building and we have an 800 seat auditorium in that building uh, that these stairs move around 
Um, and they said the best thing about this jazz festival, in addition to all the wonderful music, was the acoustics and the sight lines and all those good things. And this kind of praise is nice to hear. Um, happened to be not from an architectural critic, but a music critic, so I hold that in high regard. This is on the second floor overlooking Fifth Avenue. I'm uh, just showing you this because at different strata of the city it allows you to experience the verticality of the city uh, in new and different ways than you typically do. The brass is shingled on the building. We wanted to do this to give it texture and give it a sense of humanity. We worked hard um, on the exact finish of the uh, Munts metal, this uh, form of brass, and it's a hand finish and it's highly modeled and variegated. Um, and we did that on purpose so that it would, had a, 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 um, a kind of hand-hewn quality about it. It's adjacent to a couple historic buildings and you can see we added additional lines to mediate different important horizontal relationships to the neighboring buildings. So I think both a radical building but a sensitive building to context and it's quite spectacular and beautiful at night. And if you all want to visit it someday, you're welcome. We can arrange that. Uh, a recent commission, new, new School was good for our practice um, in the city. And we received this commission at Barnard College. So it's across Broadway from Columbia University. They have one piece of green space, which is in the foreground here. It's about 10,000 square feet, and that's the sum total of the green space on their campus. Um, the building we're doing is, is in the background there and faces this, um, this green space. And it's <coughs> a teaching and learning center, um, predominantly uh, a 21st century library with uh, faculty functions, uh, uh, state-of-the-art laboratories for gaining knowledge, a bridge into the adjacent science building uh, at the fifth floor, and um, teachers' lounges, etc. This is the site of, this is their entire campus, so Columbia's on the bottom uh, of this view, so that's the entirety of the campus. Our project's right in the center of that campus. <clears throat> And there's an existing building uh, done in the 70s that's sitting on the site. Currently, it's being demolished as we speak. Existing building is a library, and it's uh, underused, as a lot of libraries probably are these days. We designed this building and stacked up the various um, aspects of the program in unique and interesting ways to create uh, synergies in the building that created a sense of excitement as it stacked up. We also stacked up the massing, the higher massing of the project to the north. So we studied the sun, um, the sun arc uh, greatly and didn't want to diminish the amount of sunlight that fell on the existing lawn. So we actually have an equal amount of sunlight uh, on the lawn, even though the building we're building is twice as large as the existing building that we're taking down. We're also leveling out the lawn. So currently, when you enter their campus, you go downstairs, walk across this, uh, this lawn, and then go back upstairs to go back down. And we're raising the whole thing up about uh, two feet. It has many different interesting functions. The, the pink part at the bottom is the 21st century library. We studied the uh, NC State Library, the Hunt Library, that Snowheda did. It's pretty interesting um, in its combination of um, how many books, you know, how you access the books, the, the sort of electronic and computerized labs, the, data mining labs that they have in the building, how they integrate social spaces into the project, how the social spaces interact with the study spaces and the, the book spaces, et cetera, and uh, very different ways to think about libraries than people did when, let's like, say, the New York Public Library or some of the more classical libraries were designed back in the day. So, in designing this project, we had an idea to have um, terraces on the low stack of the building. 
And by doing this, we could make them green. Um, they have a good orientation. They face east. And these green terraces are all one story tall so that no one can get hurt jumping from one to the other. A big consideration in a school. And we doubled the amount of green space in the heart of their campus by doing this. So basically sort of green terraces, amphitheater overlooking uh, the new raised up flattened green lawn, the project. So this is a view looking from one of their existing buildings, a McKinney White building, looking across uh, and seeing the green terraces cascading down to the uh, main green quad of the campus. We're using zinc, a patinated zinc on this project. Um, we're also shingling it because we wanted uh, a kind of human texture to this project. Um, so these, um, these shingles protrude out about two inches. The ones at New School protrude out about nine inches. They're much more robust, but it's a more physical part of the city where they are in New School and a more gentle uh, campus um, at Barnard College. Inside, there's a, a heart to the library. It's in a piano noble, one story above the lawn level. Um, there's a green terrace out to the right uh, that overlooks the lawn. Um, it's sheathed in wood. There's a book wall on the right that separates uh, pure stack areas uh, to the west from these study areas here. And we have an interconnected stair. So the um, secure area of the library, which is three stories tall, has an interconnected wood stair that connects all the secure levels of the library together. Obviously, it has elevator access outside the secure area for each floor. Um, study carrels built into the book wall, lighting built into the book wall. We spend a lot of time on these kind of considerations where the lighting and things um, has a, a wonderful quality, but you don't necessarily see the source condition of the illumination. Inside the building, lots of cool spaces that these new age libraries um, all look like they have. Uh, this one is a movement lab to capture three-dimensional human movements and map them. Uh, Twyla Tharp was one of their alum um, and was very interested in this kind of curriculum. We have a motion uh, visualization lab uh, where you can visualize in the surround uh, complex three-dimensional imaging, so weather patterns and things like that, and understand how to analyze them. And we also have maker spaces, so a bit like a, a wood shop or a studio shop or a three-dimensional printing shop that you might have uh, at your school here, um, and a creativity lab where uh, lots of um, other interesting kind of electronic uh, data mining and exploration happen in the project. Up on top of the building, uh, in between the faculty stack and the library stack, we have a computerization uh, room, computer science room, and also a math room. So currently, all their math studies happen across the street at, at Columbia, and they're bringing some math faculty over here. And the, we gave them a sort of glass pavilion overlooking two green terraces on either side of the project. Next project is the Air Force Academy. So the firm had a beautiful tradition. Uh, it's nice to discover these things where they hired a famous photographer to go and document a site before they intervened on the site. And they did this for many different reasons. One was to build political consensus and things of that sort. And this was an idea that Nat Owings had uh, and commissioned Ansel Adams to do uh, spend two days on the site of the Air Force Academy before it was a project and document the site. And you can see little farms and things here. This is the ramparts of the Rocky Mountain. And they're beautiful negatives that um, Ansel Adams did of the site. This is the project that SOM did. So um, attributed to Walter Netsch, who was a partner, a young partner at SOM. Uh, he was in his late 20s when he worked on this project, so uh, big project for a, a young person, uh, a bit overseen by Gordon Bunshaft from, from New York, and unbelievable. It's, you know, imagine a commission at this scale that was this finely designed that happened all at once, and they built it. And then 
that campus became a national landmark. So it was intact. And then imagine that because it was a national landmark and so beautiful that nothing really happened for 30 or 40 years, no new buildings. And then they had a competition for a new building and they wanted this new building to be a signature building like the chapel, that building there, um, but one that wasn't a religious uh, symbol but a secular symbol for the campus. So these are just different images of the existing buildings that were done in the early 60s of this project. A very disciplined kind of project, three primary levels uh, that organize the uh, campus. There's a service level shown here in blue. There's a cadet level shown in yellow. And then there's a small public area uh, called the Court of Honor that's uh, highlighted here in, um, in an orange color. And each of these is segregated and separated vertically. So the cadets stay at the cadet level, the public stays at the public level, and the service staff stay at the, the service level of the project. And that's how it operates today. So an existing photograph, a contemporary photograph of the project, uh, looking back at the subject site where they held the competition, which is in the upper right uh, part of the project. We won the competition. And that's our solution. Um, that's bu a built photograph from my iPhone, so it's not yet finished photography. Uh, it's a new um, curriculum that they're starting for character and leadership um, on the campus. That's, again, the site. So interesting how these things happen and how you win things like this. And it's important to consider this. And, uh, I always look at you know, understanding the place and being observant and trying to uh, listen and observe. And this is their symbol, the Air Force Academy's symbol, their the sort of shield, their patch. And in the center of this, uh, located in the black, um, is the Polaris, the North Star. So we had the idea that this, um, the forum, the, the new part of this, uh, this, this curriculum, this program, uh, which is essentially a meeting, a gathering space, not unlike this, we could uh, organize it to focus at all times on the Polaris and create a Polaris alignment. And that became the design we had for this project. So the lean of the skylight feature that I'll explain in a minute is the latitude of Colorado Springs which is 39 degrees, and if you, uh, that angle, um, you can make uh, a line with the Polaris, no matter how the Earth rotates, day or night, uh, across all the seasons of the year. So at the bottom, highlighted in red, is the Wing Honor, Honor Conference Room, and that's where they have serious meetings about character and leadership, and there's an oculus in the ceiling of that room, and it has a direct alignment to the oculus on the top of the skylight. And at the top of the uh, alignment, 100% uh, of the time is in alignment with the Polaris, which is their symbol. After we were done with the presentation, you know, it was pretty much done. And um, it's, it, it, you know, important things to, to think about for the project. Um, so, uh, it was a competition, it was a kind of concept sketch, and they didn't want to change a thing. They wanted to go straight to working drawings. And I imagine that. Um, and we had a lot of uh, learning to do, and we went back. They had a 28-foot grid that was a disciplined organizational feature of the, uh, of the school, of the campus. We used that. We extended part of the uh, court of honor, the public level, and most of the program is below that level, so very quiet. We have our skylight piece that's 105 feet tall. It leans out about 30 feet to the north. Um, and we have subdivisions of the 28-foot grid that generate the structure of the sk skylight piece. It's a building without a primary entrance. It has five uh, entrances that are sort of equally weighted all for different constituencies of the Air Force Academy. So the blue one is the cadet uh, honor 
members entrance. The red one is the other cadet entrance. Both of those happen at the cadet level le uh, plateau of the project. The orange one is the ceremonial entrance from the court of honor, the public level. The green one is for the senior uh, officers to enter directly from their uh, administration building. And the yellow one is uh, an additional public entrance from the assembly venue, Arnold Hall, um, of their campus. So imagine doing a building with five entrances equally treated and how you communicate that you're in this new thing uh, with dispersed entrances pretty much on the five corners uh, of the project. This is an early rendering. The building uh, is just finishing up, so we don't have any finished photography. Um, this is the, um, the courtyard, the assembly space under the skylight. This is um, uh, an early model of uh, the structure of the skylight. So like some of our early SOM projects, a clear tectonic for the project. I'll explain that more in a minute and how those structural forces come to the ground. And then these structural lines uh, organize individual conference rooms adjacent to that main assembly hall of the project and are sheathed in glass and then face out also to exterior landscaped courtyards. One of the great landscape designers um, of the late 20th century was Dan Kiley and he did the gardens at the Air Force Academy and he had interesting concepts for them, air terraces and things of that sort is how he characterized them. Um, so we went along with some of his kind of thinking for these two new uh, landscape courtyards that we have. This is again from my iPhone um, of the um, interior space. Uh, we considered strongly not only the tectonics of the structure and the architecture, but also how the lighting works. And all the lighting is at the lower part of the skylight. And we reflect 100% of the light for this forum off of these mirrors that are hung in the center of the room. And so these rooms and the lights can be tuned um, to be flexible for different kind of venues that they're gonna have. And at the top center is the oculus alignment, which is actually an ellipse, not a circle, um, that lets the North Star always be up there. And the North Star wobbles a little bit. Um, and we've captured the uh, wobble and we worked, collaborated with an astronomer on the project. This is the finished structure Again, from uh, just my iPhone, the armature for the mirrors, the mirrors aren't in yet. The top uh, surround of the oculus, which is uh, um, actually a louver, it lets the skylight breathe and, and pulls uh, the hot air up through the building and exhausts it at the top. And the structure is a, a true um, uh, depiction, manifestation of the lateral forces of the project. So at the corners, um, so it's 18 uh, equal vertical stacks. Uh, this was made in Germany by Gartner and shipped over. And they literally stacked these 18 pieces on top of each other. The corners are about eight inches deep. The structure in the corners is about eight inches deep. And it swells into the middle to be three feet deep. Um, and that's because of the lateral wind forces of the project and then goes back to eight inches in the corner. So it's quite beautiful and elegant and a true tectonic um, representation of the forces of the project. And this is just explaining it a bit um, more in, in diagram form about the structure. The building is um, platinum lead, um, has air tubes that um, bring cool air, it, beautiful climate out there, um, wonderful amount of sun days, probably the highest amount of sun days in the whole country, uh, the U.S. that is, um, and it pulls cool air through and, and pushes it up through the skylight. You know, we do lots of light harvesting and different things of that sort. It has um, uh, displacement air ventilation, so it's very quiet inside. That's when you uh, supply the air at the bottom of the space and don't hear the sort of mechanical noise uh, for the project. So very comfortable, impressive building. We worked really hard on the top. We imagine someday we do drone photographs. So this Oculus piece on top uh, was well designed and you can see all the, 
the fanatical alignments with the, uh, the grid, the module, the seven foot module and how that resolves itself on the top of the project. Uh, Penta Ultimate project here, this is the um, airport uh, in Mumbai. Uh, this airport is the busiest airport in all of India. So all those, what I consider smaller projects, and then imagine like you get this gigantic commission, five million square feet, uh, the busiest airport in India, uh, a totally complex culture uh, to work in. A friend of mine, Robert Polidori, famous photographer, he does uh, photographs of sort of provisional conditions uh, that won't exist in the future of the world. Um, and this is, we hired him to go and photograph some of these slums that are inside the secure perimeter of the airport that will be slightly um, altered by the new terminal. Uh, this is the slum that was where Slumdog Millionaire was filmed, if anyone saw that, that film. This is the finished uh, building. It opened last February. Um, this head house piece is, um, is the um, visual symbol of the project. Most airports are occluded by the parking garage in front. We made sure the parking garage was suppressed so this temple, this white temple, this uh, airport entry pavilion can sit on top of it. Uh, this piece alone, uh, the roof of it is 17 acres large. So 70,000 square meters uh, in, in, in metric. This project, ha the, the, the shape of it is this X, uh, you can see in the, the black outline with the white infill. There's an existing terminal, uh, there was an existing terminal shown in red, and that terminal had to stay functioning whilst this new building was being constructed. So totally operational, totally functional. They didn't want any loss of service while you're building this building around it and interconnecting to it and using the same road systems. So quite profound. And the yellow colors on either side are some of these slum developments that are inside the secure perimeter. So nothing the government can do. They just clip the fence and they start building these villages inside and they're beautiful, dense forms of urbanism where real people live, get dressed up, go to work, have real jobs. It's quite amazing to see. And then there's a, a creek that runs through the site as well. So incredibly complicated site. Two runways um, at the airport, so very constrained uh, in addition to all the other encumbrances of the project. And transportation facilities, uh, the important thing to uh, focus on is about functionality and intuitive wayfinding. Those are sort of the primary considerations, uh, operational considerations. And really how this project works is you come to the center and then you're distributed out to the wings where you load um, and disembark the airplanes. We didn't really know how to start, culturally speaking, with the right appropriate references for the project. Uh, India has complex cultures, there are influences from Persia, there were influences from other parts of the Middle East, there were influences from Asia, um, all there, and imagine, you know, someone from the West coming and trying to interpret this and making appropriate gestures for this project, and I'll address that more in a minute. But we decided to, like the Taj Mahal, to have a sort of temple piece, and that's the main arrival piece, so departures and arrivals, and then where you board the aircraft is more of a landscape piece, the X form from the earlier plan, which is shown here in the darker, in the darker red. In that main piece that has a 17 acre roof or 70,000 square meter uh, ceiling, uh, we have 30 columns, and these columns span, their, their spans are 64 by 34 meters uh, in a horizontal dimension and they're 40 meters tall in an unbraced length. So really serious structure happening here uh, for the project. Here's the finished uh, project. Um, this was back in February. Polidori took these photographs as well. It's basically a three-dimensional uh, casting from our computer model of this ceiling. This is the structure. It's um, 
one that has a catwalk in it, so all the lighting fixtures uh, and skylights are hidden from view. So day or night, uh, their peak loads are at night. Um, the peak international loads are at night. So when you come in here, the 8,500 holes in the ceiling let light into the space, uh, whether it's artificial or natural light. The source is always the same through the ceiling lights. So there's a kind of uh, con um, consistent condition day to night in the project. It's tricky to figure this out, uh, the ceiling and how to cast it. We built many models um, in our office. Uh, just to give you an idea of the scale, that's the largest aircraft that's, um, that's being made now, the Airbus 380, the double-decker plane, uh, and that's our ceiling of the main space there. You can see the 30 columns, and each column capital has this complex geometry, this uh, coffering. Uh, it's made out of GFRC or GFRG, depending if you're inside or outside the project. When you look at it, you can't tell the difference. It's so precisely cast from our computer models uh, that it looks like it's carved out of a single piece when you go to see it. Uh, inside, we have uh, each of the 8,500 skylight um, perforations in the ceiling. We have a small um, ring of dichroic glass. So dichroic uh, glass transmits one color and reflects a second color. So as you're moving around, um, in this airport, uh, there's a color shift and you have dapples of light on the floor, kind of like a sequin dress or something like that. And so lighting and this uh, magical kind of lighting that reminds you or evokes India is a big part of the experience of moving through this project. We did lots of experiments with exactly the type of glass. We decided to use colors from the peacock, the tail feathers of a peacock, because that's a good luck symbol um, in India. You know, I'm sure you guys are all experts at uh, form finding and parametric modeling and all that sort of thing. Um, and we had to rationalize this, uh, the ceiling system so that it could be built, it could be assembled, um, but also there's a finite number of pieces that could be repeated in a, a bit, except at the edges, uh, so that it's affordable and constructible. And then you have to convince the client that all that's possible. And imagine doing that with something that's 70,000 square meters. <laughs> Uh, so the X part, the sort of uh, landscape part of the project is largely sheathed in wood and has wooden screens on the perimeter and is only lit by chandeliers. You can see that on the left there. And this is one of the approaches to the gates. So to interpret the complexity of culture, we made an alliance, a collaboration with uh, two probably the most famous fashion designers in India. Uh, they design uh, clothes and uh, produce weddings for Bollywood stars all over India, uh, Abu Jani and Sadeep Kosla, um, and they were amazing, uh, very facile at interpreting forms and patterns and different things like that. And so these fashion designers did light walls in the immigration, they did lights, they did all the frit patterns on all the glass, <coughs> for the project, they did custom carpets, and it's a wonderful mixture of sort of modern architecture and well-considered uh, issues of lighting, but also sensitivity to culture and place. Uh, we recently won another airport in Bangalore, which is like their Silicon Valley, and we are again collaborating with uh, these two fashion designers on that project. We're just starting that project. It's magical, it's beautiful. I, I don't know if any of you have been there, but it's pretty wonderful. So the last project, uh, thank you for your patience, uh, is um, a wonderful project in South Florida. So a hedge fund, Fortress, bought an existing freight rail line, and this freight rail line goes from Center City, Miami, near the cultural museums, up all the coastal cities, and then they got the right of way to the Orlando airport. And the idea is to build a private rail service, something like the Acela that connects Boston, New York, and Washington on the East Coast, a kind of high-speed rail line. <clears throat> this one's totally private, though. And this is the site in Center City, Miami. It's six blocks long, uh, a virgin site. So this is 
our design sketch for that. Um, this is a mapping of how wonderfully interconnected this, um, this existing path is. It goes through the center of all the coastal towns up the coast from Center City, Miami, and then it'll connect directly to the airport in Miami. The site is in yellow. Um, it has some mature development around it, uh, largely a government center. And the orange up on the top right is uh, becoming a retail and cultural destination. That's where the Perez is that uh, Herzog and Demeron uh, did recently, which is it's just beautiful project. So we had to consider um, architecture at the scale of infrastructure. Again, a little bit ironic given the where I came from doing smaller projects. So an aqueduct or Paul Rudolph's building um, in lower Manhattan that never happened. So architecture at the scale of, of infrastructure and gigantic site. Um, the site is 1,100 feet long, imagine. Um, and it has streets that go through it currently. So the rail lines couldn't be at grade. So we had to lift the rail line up in the air 50 feet to get this to work so that the streets could go under the project and uh, keep the city connected. We did that, we created these air holes in the project uh, for each street and each pedestrian connection and provided separate structure and provisions for overbuilds that they wanted to build, so office buildings and housing and parking and a park on top of this project that you can see represented in green. The project, um, here is a clear tectonic. Um, this expression is the lateral system for the, uh, the station that's perched up 50 feet in the air. Um, there's a clear dimension under here of 35 feet and the stations in this glass part underneath um, the train tracks that sit up there. You can see in yellow uh, one of the trains moving through the project. We had to have three separate structures here, one for the heavy trains. They're building 17 train sets by Siemens out in California, so very heavy things that vibrate and have exhaust. That had to have a separate structure. The part that held up the platforms and the perimeter and the retail and the stations uh, was the part that you saw in V, and then the overbuilds had to be threaded down through those two different structures uh, so they didn't experience the vibration of the heavy trains moving through, et cetera. We oriented the structure um, to have a southeast bias so that the high sun and the morning sun created these reflections off the bias of the structure of the project and kind of made it sparkle during uh, certain parts of the day. And this just shows you a bit of the complexity of having all these mixed uses stacked up on the project. So some renderings of the project, uh, you know, we had to go through public approvals down there, not only convincing the client, but also all the public constituencies uh, as we had to create a whole zoning, special zoning district to make this project happen. Some of the insides, again, like an airport, it's about uh, wayfinding and uh, clear path of travels. There's a food hall uh, on the upper part. You can look through the food hall and see the trains on the top. And from the trains, you can look down uh, through the food hall and down to the bottom of the project. In West Palm Beach and Fort Lauderdale, there'll be smaller stations, and they share a design language with the mothership station in Center City, Miami. And you can see those here. Again, the structure is a working structure with a clear tectonic. And the project is in construction, so amazing. It's going to happen pretty soon. Uh, Dean Summer mentioned in these, his uh, generous prelude about some of the um, publication initiatives. Uh, the SOM journals on the upper left, uh, external uh, judges that come in and harshly critique at times the internal workings of the firm and we sort of print the naked transcripts and the idea is to continue to elevate our practice to be better and better and better. Um, it's been quite uh, well received uh, from the outside and I think a lot of other design firms are adopting similar 
uh, critical methods, not unlike a critique at school that you might have. The bottom left is a new venture we started last year. Uh, it's to speak about architectural subjects, but use A-list writers that aren't architectural writers. So the first one was about the future of the skyscraper. So we had such notable writers as Will Self, shortlisted for the Booker Prize, and Bruce Sterling, who invented cyberpunk, a form of science fiction, um, Dixon Despaumier, who wrote about vertical farming, things of that sort. It's basically addressing the impacts, the kind of um, visual considerations, the sort of social considerations of these large things that we build that inhabit our cities and how people react to them um, and experience them. And it's trying to create a different uh, lens uh, from which to see these. The next one we're working on now is about um, the future of public space. We recently had a, a whole issue of Detail Magazine about our uh, structural innovations that came out quite beautiful and a whole issue of A plus U on the firm's work and you can see the airport there and we're celebrating certain works that the firm is currently producing that represent our ethos and um, that's an example on the bottom right. So we're busy doing projects and doing publications and just to uh, say that firms like ours that are global um, and doing well uh, can support various forms of experimentation and I think I'm just a manifestation of that opportunity. So thank you for your time. The only one I've had the opportunity to see is the, uh, the new school one. Um, I think little pictures of some of the others and they really are uh, you know, both in the issues they bring up and their geographic range, uh, they, 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 we, we could just have a conversation about one of these projects. I want to start maybe in a, in a slightly different place and maybe we can get back to some of the particularities of the project, which have to do with um, the nature of clients today. Um, so I want to ask you, considering you know that you've been at it for a while, uh, that you have a particular, it seems a particular place in the place where you're not just doing large commercial projects, but you're working actually with a, a large range of institutional, you know, Air Force, companies, uh, universities. So uh, how do you think that the process of work, of commissioning projects and working with clients has, has changed in the last, let's say, generation, the last 25 years? You can do any of the projects or... It's a great question your dean is asking because it's um, he 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 knows the answer. <laughs> <laughs> know the answer in my little world. <laughs> uh, so back in the day when SOM established its reputation, uh, the partners could walk into a room and and talk to the head of Lever House, for instance, and say, "This is the project you should build on Park Avenue," and you know they're saying, "Excuse me, this is like modern and everything around it is." Neoclassical, and they said, "No, this is this is what you need to build. This is the right building for the site. And by the way, it's underbuilt by half the FAR that you can put on the site. That would never happen. The area, right? Yeah, half half the area that's possible. Absolutely never happened today. Um, and and it's because there was this sort of one-on-one -on -one communication that could happen. Maybe that happens on small houses or something of that sort." But now these clients are incredibly sophisticated. So on an airport project, there would be a team of expert clients that might be 30 or 40 people, you know, engineers that deal only with baggage systems and operation engineers that deal with how you uh, load planes or how the planes move around and, and all of these things. And so you have to understand all of this but, and master it before you can present a design idea because they'll just peck you to death, wound the chicken in the, in the farm yard. Um, so so it's, it's really, you know, the dean wisely talked in his prelude about the, nat the, the difference between a single practitioner that's, you know, a signature architect and, and the sort of idea of a team or a collaboration. And my own personal feeling based on my world, my practice, is that the signal practitioner that does everything and creates everything out of a gesture is total bullshit. 
and do you need uh, the depth of team and this kind of collaborative team and leveraging the creativity of all the people on that team to pull these things off. So what, you're, what you think you might be perceiving in terms of how the world works isn't really how the world works. And you know, it's it, this idea of working in a team and understanding what one can bring is really um, important in the future and becoming increasingly more so day by day uh, because that's what the clients look like. Yeah, so you're saying two things. One is the projects themselves are complex and require um, various kinds of, you know, uh, technical, structural, sociological, environmental expertise uh, in their own right, but they're also commissioned by institutions and clients who possess some of this knowledge themselves. You have to match them or exceed exceed them in order, in, in order to have the authority to, to, to innovate and to build something, right? A new school, for instance, I, I consider it an innovative project. The client didn't have the internal expertise to um, build the project, so they had two forms of advisors. They had John Tishman, who started the largest construction firm in America, built the first five skyscrapers over 100 stories, a real guy like who really knows what he's done, and the Durst organization, a, de a hardcore New York development family, to be the owner's representative on the project. So all design meetings happened in their offices with them present. Um, and they dictated terms of how this happened. So imagine doing that um, and convincing that this group well, that this is the right approach for this building. So again, it's under you know, everything's creative, and, and these groups appreciate creativity, but you have to do it on their terms. You have to do it in a kind of um, disciplined, intellectual, pragmatic way um, and it, that addresses all their concerns. It, it's, a, it's a great question, and, um, you know, we don't have enough time to explore it, you know, in the depth that it deserves, but maybe it's a subject for someone you might invite back for a future lecture. It's, it's important. The, um, the Air Force Academy, do you have any sense of uh, even how an organization like that has changed in the way that they go about doing projects? Because as you said, it's a remarkable circumstance where your firm got to come back after how many years? Uh, 63 to, you know. To something which. Four years ago. Yeah, to s something which hasn't really changed. Um, the culture has probably changed. Um, so uh, how, how, was, uh, how, was, how was building that? Was that, was that a very different kind of client? Because as you said, they were just ready to go, right? Yeah, <laughs> They I think thought they were ready to go. There are some interesting stories surrounding that one. So uh, Nat Owings, he was uh, one of the founders of the firm, a very able, um, person that created energy and excitement for things. That was really his, his strength. And uh, he had this, he envisioned this team of young people coming together and creating this, uh, this idea for this project. And he wanted it to be distinctly modern of its day. And he had to build consensus with politicians to pull that off. So hiring Ansel Adams and Heinrich Blessing and the best industrial designers of the day and things of that sort, he did to organize a display that included a large-scale model of this project and, he, and renderings and photographs and all that and invited the politicians in. And he actively, proactively built consensus for this project. So at that time, the client was really the Congress and the Senate. And you know, our, our client was indirectly the Congress and Senate, but more directly the senior administrators of the campus and um, different other constituencies they have on the private side that will, would donate money for this project. So, you know, Yes, we dealt with the senior admin people, but we also went to the Pentagon to present to five-star generals and things like that. So again, very complex kind of um,
client structures for projects like that. But that you're saying the difference between, it, well, besides the historical difference, between creating something new and uh, then doing a project for an established inst institution. It's a little bit like the last project you showed, which is really seems like a kind of new entity, uh, which uh, in a way requires you to conceptualize really the, the, what the thing is r r rather than deal with something, you know, uh, adapting to something which are, already exists. Um, where do you think the, those kind of opportunities exist in terms of the kind of work you can get? I mean, what are the new, in a sense, the new problems? I mean, we're building a lot of skyscrapers, but there may be not, or maybe I'm wrong, not a new problem, but there are things like these trans and infrastructure problems which maybe present new kinds of challenges and require that kind of uh, bringing together of things which haven't been understood before. What, what kind of things like that do you think are on the horizon? One thing, um, it's a great question. I thought a bit about this the, uh, recently in Hong Kong. I don't know if anyone's been there recently. But it made me reconsider the subject of architecture from, as an exterior experience. So speaking about the future, it's, uh, and the thing that did that was the, uh, you can, downtown uh, Hong Kong, you can take your bag and check in at the airport, a downtown kind of station, get your train ticket for a specific time, you know, get rid of your bag and then go whatever, walk around or have lunch or do whatever. And then at the point in time, you go back, you get on a train, 22 minutes later, you arrive at, um, it's called Terminal 2, which is really a food hall, retail pavilion, not the airport per se. You get out, you, you need to do, your bag's already gone to the plane, um, have lunch, and you go through security in that building, and then you take another train directly to your gate. So, you know, Foster did a wonderful terminal there, but in a manner of speaking, you never have to see the inside of it. So what's the importance of these sort of iconic structures in the future, or is it more about interconnected networks, sets of interiors? And, it's a really fascinating subject, and you know, architects um, like to do iconic and showy things and things that have a kind of presence. But you know, is that really more the future, or you know, is it a connected set of interiors that's more the future? And and furthermore, um, there's a great artist doing a, an amazing project in uh, the desert in Nevada, Heiser. It's called the City. I don't know if you mm -hmm. know about that project. Students might want to study it. Has that been at it for a while? Yeah. But, but it's, it's, it's challenging the notion of, this is on my own words, the notion of gestalt, where gestalt is like, you know, you can sort of take a whole scene in and mentally understand it. And he spread his art experience out in a landscape over several miles, um, is messing around with the land datum and going down or up from it, and you can only experience it by moving through it. So there's not this singular moment when you sort of can take it all in. But there's nothing to see in a picture. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and so connected set of interiors reminded me of that, where it's you know, sort of ungestalt condition, where you, you have to be moving through it to understand it. And what is it that you're absorbing? You know, it's not just one thing. It's a series of things. It's almost like film. But I'm kind of fascinated by that. I, I think this future world is going to be more like that. Um, I don't know if there's that a, answers your question exactly. Well, there's a great, uh, somewhat flawed film by um, yeah. Orson Welles, The Trial, which yeah. basically he had to film in a series of cities, which is just an endless series of interiors. But I think, I guess what you're saying, whether we're talking about built up campuses or highly urbanized cities, that the the Understanding the connectedness and, and the, in a way, collapse between the interior and exterior as part of a continuous experience is really the, the important architecture and not, not the objects or even the way they're seen in a, in a, in a, in a kind of uh, iconic way, right? Possibly. But I mean, <laughs> that, that's just one of my own personal theories, but yeah. who, who knows if it'll... Well, you, I mean, in, in a sense, you, can, you could see even the building at uh, the, the new school as, you know, if one were given a pallet, that system actually could have uh, uh, 
escape the building. And uh, if you had more buildings, right, it, it could have it could have taken them on. And that's that's what Hong Kong is like, right? You get yeah. you get a kind of infrastructure which which uh, uh, is more robust because of the amount of transit and mobility than, than any one piece of architecture. So I have, we don't have much more time. I have one, one, one more question, um, really uh, turning back more into the firm about the, how, the, how the structure of the firm itself has evolved in, in, um, in recent years. Uh, and at, at what point you decide uh, between the development of expertise internally Bring an architecture and many of the things you've showed, and at what point you say we need to actually uh, be collaborating with uh, uh, others on this? I mean, how do you find that balance between be between SOM as its own industry and and your your place in the larger network of of uh, we we um, have about a thousand people working in the firm, so might seem large, but in this, you know, compared to some of these aggregated firms now, it's not large. Yeah. Uh, but we are privately owned, so the partners own the business, and we have incredible freedom to just keep focusing on quality. We're not really driven by business. I think that that consistent um, framework of the firm in the beginning and in recent time, I think there was a difficult moment in the 80s when maybe that wasn't exactly the case, but we've righted, um, righted the ship to do that. Um, so we're, we're doing what we want to do and we're doing it the way we want to do it and doing the opportunities we want to, to pursue. Um, and it's, for, for architects to be able to say that, that's a great privilege. You know, it's a, it's a challenging profession, but, um, you know, have to, um, you know, I decided to go to a big firm and I really started at the bottom um, and worked my way up. But, um, you know, many of you that will graduate have to decide what, it, what kind of architect you want to practice because there's a whole variety. There's richness and rewards for all the different ways to approach it. So I just did it one way and probably other people that you have heard here did it their own way. It just shows you that almost anything's possible, and you could do creative work that way. Yeah. And you felt it's, yeah. it's a great platform. It's an experimental platform. All this stuff, like these journals and these books, and bringing these crazy artists in or writers, you know, the you know the the partnership just says, yeah, that seems like a good idea. Let's do that. Let's support that. So we have about ten minutes. Um, if anyone has any burning questions, don't be shy. Just building on. Uh, just to build on the last question, you talked about sort of a, a thousand person office as sort of a firm. Um, but I guess there's, there's obviously multiple studios that operate at much smaller scales, uh, almost as uh, almost, you know, microcosms and little studios all around the world. Um, those, I imagine, are probably far more like, smaller, engaging, sort of, probably anything from 50 to 100 person sort of offices. And those probably have a fairly more intimate culture. Um, and in terms of sort of the spread of the principles across, across the firm, um, and you obviously jumped a fair bit internationally on projects, um, how does that sort of come through to you know everyone starting from the bottom in terms of a culture and how do you retain that culture within all the practices across the world I guess you know like you know there isn't probably you know there isn't a book I guess that everyone reads when they join SOM that says this is the way we're gonna do this and this is the way right. so it has to come from the people obviously that, that lead these uh, these smaller offices I'm just curious to know sort of how for a firm that's been around for as long as it is uh, and continues to evolve um, how challenging that is, and if it is, and uh, how you you know yourself you think you, uh, you've actually gone about doing it. So we we have um, a philosophical ethos that guides us, um, and you just know what it is. Um, we also have we we uh, leverage and trust talent, so it's not an, it's an anti-authoritarian. 
kind of construct, uh, you know, best idea wins kind of thing, and um, that's the one that gets advanced. And people uh, to exp leverage their intelligence and talents and efforts. Um, so I think it's a great place. Um, it's a very encouraging place for um, certain talented people that it happens to work for. Uh, I'm not sure. It works for everyone. Uh, is, there, is there a lot of migration from offices, especially among the younger, it's, younger it's staff? It's some, there's some of that. We're starting to do it more deliberately. But it's not like Overp where they deliberately have people migrate around the world um, intentionally. And we're not quite at that, at that place. But we do have people that, that move around office to office to spread the culture. I have a difficult question that I'm not quite sure I can formulate, but um, I was quite struck by the um, importance of what you referred to as the tectonic in a number of the projects. And I noted in the New School for Social Research, and there's a whole story of how an institution like that would end up with SOM as the architects. But I noticed in that particular project that the interior appeared to be quite neutral and I would even describe minimalist in design. The exterior clearly had a very strong tectonic related to the, the uh, skin covering the frame, which is expressed in the, in the stairs. But, but th that didn't seem to insinuate itself into the interior. And in the uh, Air Force Academy, the tectonic of the, of the tower infiltrates down into the interior and clearly affects the perception of the interior but I had the, ex had the sense that it didn't in fact at least as a kind of um, culture, a culture of design, the more neutral platform. So I'd be interested in talking, so I, I had the sense that <clears throat> in a certain sense each project pursued a tectonic which could be described as iconographic in its final effects but it wasn't pursuing the tectonic in a, a sort of Semperian or Violet Leducian um, uh, kind of ideological way. That's why, it's, if you know what I mean? No, it's, it's, a, it's a great question. I mean, you know, sort of Violet Leduc um, point of view of a tectonic is like Air Force or maybe about some of the writings of Ken Frampton or some of the things like that. But um, you know, I think that what drives some of our explorations is uh, creative freedom. So sometimes it's sort of, let me call it the tectonics of harvesting light or tectonics of uh, the structure, as in the case of Air Force, or the tectonics of this uh, network series of um, vertically disposed social spaces with circulation. And so, you know, maybe, you know, I'm not great because I'm not incredibly rigid about that, but that's fine. It's just, uh, th there's a kind of creativity in any one of these aspects that we can explore in the building. It doesn't just have to be, you know, how the structure is up in the project and the clarity of the structure. You know, structure is a component of the systems or a component of the building, the way the functions are laid out is a kind of set of components of the building. And I don't know, I see them all as fertile territory to explore. But it's a, it's a good question and one that, um, uh, so I guess I'm not so doctrinaire. <laughs> well, Barry knows perfectly well that in the, shall we see the economy of academic buildings today, sustaining that level of tectonic across the entire interior would be yeah. very difficult. Uh, especially given the flexibility you were talking about in that, in the, in the outfitting of the uh, or the use over time of the interiors. Each one of these is, projects is like uh, it's it's you give it your all. Like you are totally spent when when you're done with these projects, uh, and you do as much as you can, and you can't do everything. You, know, you just give it your all for four years, and you know 
It's like a little piece of you dies. You know, you can't. No, it's. And you're only showing the ones that were built. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, you give it your all. Into uh, another aspect, uh, and thank you, Roger, for a very interesting presentation. But the role of research, both in terms of the relationship of SOM to certain uh, academic institutions, I think, uh, particularly of case uh, out of, of RPI, and they're being headquartered in SOM's New York office, yeah, or uh, the kind of uh, what Fazlur Khan initiated in the continued thing. I guess one of the things that comes up is, uh, I mean, many people in Canada have been talking in a much uh, smaller way about uh, timber frame uh, harass, and the best work in the US is being done at SOM. And uh, I think particularly for the students, uh, the explanation of the integration of what is research and practice or research uh, Informed practice. In, 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 uh, with the institution might be yeah. uh, a nice way to say, and thank it does you. play that, out. That sounds like the last question, but thank you for, I mean, it will have you, to seem, be. you seem to know a lot, but we have structural engineers and uh, firm-wide and very creative people, and they're doing all kinds of uh, continuing FOSCON's legacy of, of research. And also, I would say Myron Goldsmith kind of started that line of thinking, didn't get much credit for it. Um, and we're doing that now, the timber frame, lots of people are that also now. Um, we have, uh, from any, any given day, we have a, a, a company we're formed with Rensselaer Polytechnic, and we have say, 20 to 30 doctoral students in our office every day, and they do research on future issues of sustainability, like walls that breathe and plant materials that are in lobbies that clean the air, clean the CO2 out of the air and things we're patenting and, and, and putting in projects. Um, in the project, we do a lot of light research. Uh, also, um, you know, we have curtain wall experts. We're doing a lot of research in types of glass and glass coatings and all that sorts of things. And they're a bit like sideshows in a circus. You know, you have to let them all happen. It's like Barnum and Bailey, you know, the three ring circus and you had all these sideshows going on. And at certain moments, you sort of pull these things into the main arena um, to, to deploy them on certain projects. But if you don't have them happening, then you can't use them. So, yeah. But anyway, thank you. Um, good luck with uh, your careers and your practices. Thank you, Roger.